on my tiptoes. Oh, thanks. Hi, so I'm Jen Pollins. I run the School for Contemporary Dance and Thought. And we're so happy to be here. It's feeling just great and cozy and beautiful and inspiring. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about HUT, which is, um, there's so many great things to say about HUT. One is that we started in 2016, and since then we've hosted over 250 artists. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I thank them all. I thank the artists tonight as well. It's been great to work with Jake and Jay in curation, so I just wanted to thank them. They're both here tonight. Jay is doing the poetry, and Jake is doing the sound. Um, and it's amazing to be in the sanctuary space because HUT does not actually stand for anything, but it's a sacred space for artists to share their, with their heart, like the love of their work through experimentation um, and through improvisation. So there's sort of a thread. You're gonna see a little bit of dance, a little bit of poetry, and a little bit of sound tonight. And the idea is sort of like a tapas bar, so enjoy. And it's amazing to there's everyone in the audience is coming for different artists so we're combining communities and it's been great to also be here in the bombix community we've been offering all of our classes and rehearsals here we'll be um, collaborating with um, the young at heart chorus on the 19th of november with hatchery which is our young artist company so you should definitely go to the academy of music and there's other collaborations coming, and we're just thrilled to be here. Um, so that, that's all that I was going to say. Oh, yes, that's it. So, oh, no, there's one more thing. Um, the show is about an hour, and between each set, you'll have a few minutes to stretch, chat. Don't look at your phones, though. Turn your phones off. That would be good. At least silence them. And um, we'll have about a four-minute break in between sets to sort of clear your palate for the next appetizer. Thank you.
you so much for having me. That was really beautiful what just happened. I feel very honored to share this stage. Um, and I'm also so glad that Hut is back. So thank you to Jay and Jay and to uh, Jen. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from a collection that I wrote called Florida Man. And uh, these poems are about a time that I was living in Florida, taking care of my dad who was dying and uh, selling pot and living in a senior community. <clears throat> so that's the terrain we're in. So I hope you're ready to go to Florida. Uh, this poem is called Death Scene. <clears throat> and they're not all about death, I promise. <clears throat> Jack holds court on his overgrown veranda while I hide from death doing a better performance of grief, more poetic. <clears throat> I brought a nice bottle of scotch, because I assume that's what men do when one of their own is dying. Jack is of little help. He got two stones, so he just keeps telling me about various women he's trying to sleep with. He tells me the last time he had a woman over, she opened the door and said, you're fat, you smoke, and your pool is green. I don't remember if he stayed, if he said she stayed or not, but she wasn't wrong. I'm wearing all my dad's clothes today, Wrangler jeans and a Walmart Wyabara. Ralphie, the embassy McDog, is coughing up a storm with his cloudy moon eyes fixed on his own ghosts. Jack has shaped himself Hulk Hogan mutton chops with mustache connected. It looks like it's on purpose to scare the woman he meets on eHarmony. I don't ask him why he did that. <clears throat> Back home, death is lurking all around the living room, and its threats are very nasty. They brought you home to die, maybe a kindness to let us kill you. The things I could tell you about your dad threatens Jack. Please don't. But thank you for having me over for this gentleman's wake. I watch sweat pool on the pregnant swell of his belly. I find a pill in my shirt pocket. I hold it up to the sun to consider. Look, Jack, it must be one of dad's. Jack plucks it from my fingers and swallows it. I figure out later it's for the prostate, the most peculiar gland. I know when it's time to go home, but I don't remember if I know why. I'd like to say that I felt the moment I stopped living in the same world as my father, a primal shiver as I became fatherless, but I didn't. <clears throat> my sister texted me to come home. I drove so drunk and wild, and I wondered if there were special permissions for DUI on your dad's death day, like how you get to speed when your wife is in labor, but probably not, because what's the point of rushing toward death? It's not like you can beat it home. My sister and I tried to convince my mom to let us cremate, we said, so that when you die, we can mix up your ashes and you can finally be together forever like you've always wanted. We said we'd take them back to Manhattan and dust them around all their old places. We said we'd mix them with coke and smoke and snort them. We want a free base, you mom. We promised a wild ride. We got in a pissing contest for who knew him best. Sure, you knew him, you knew him longer, but I wear his face. I wear his jeans. I became him for the occasion. I fight my mom to choose his burial outfit because it seems like a son thing to do. But it doesn't matter since the funeral people wash and dress him in some kind of Jewish death robes. I hate to think of my dad trapped in a box dressed like some Jewish nerd. He needs to be able to move. Father deflated all belly and balls now. Rogue fluids make the body grotesque until all that's left is his wingspan. Death is all beeps and alarms robbing rest from injured parties. It's metal and tubes and straps and raw skin and blisters and threadbare robes and flap open in the back, revealing pale, shrunken asses that used to be mighty, used to ride high in Levi's. My cat sits on his chest, curious. I pray she doesn't do anything creepy. In an elderly community, everyone knows what it means when you take death ex death's accessories to the curb. Free canes and walkers and bedpans. I realize now why you see so many adult diapers at the thrift store, and it's not because people regain confidence. So many lessons in death. It gets lighter from here, I promise. <clears throat> sort of. Um, this one's called Crack Out. It's about an old man named Crack Out. That wasn't actually his name, it was like Crack Out or something. Old man Crack Out was expecting a phone call, but I've been dodging him since he ripped off my mom. I used to like to big time old man crack out because dad said he was a shyster, so I practiced how to be a tough guy on him. Old man crack out has a dog named Nino and a cat named Nino, so he doesn't get confused. 
He's not my friend, but I do miss his little bird body and how impressed he was by the Costco steak I brought him for my mom's freezer. He said, this is quality. This is called Joanne. <clears throat> Joanne five carat is dead. Sorry. Joanne five carat is dead. Everyone thought it would be Doug first with his one leg and his dialysis. <clears throat> When she talked about a dancer, she did this little flamenco flourish to let me know she'd seen things she knew from dancers. Eighteen months ago, Joanne was leaning in my passenger seat window, and I tracked the makeup smears on her single-use mask she was reusing. She told me how she met my dad. I'll try and remember. She was crossing the street, and my dad was out with Michael Moore, the boxer, not the documentarian. And she was with Brenda, either smoking a joint or wearing a shirt with a joint on it, and so they struck up an acquaintance. One time, either I or Michael Moore, the boxer, lost $600. That was scary. Me and him and my dad glowered at each other suspiciously in an atrium lunchroom at the Delray Beach Hospital. Yeah, that was scary. Mom tells me Joanne is dead, casually. Joanne is dead? Yeah, I didn't tell you. No, you didn't tell me. Oh, I thought I told you. Joanne, I have a confession. All those times you asked for something specific, I just gave you whatever I had on hand. But you never complained, in that you were always complaining. This one's called Suzanne. Suzanne super glues little plastic orchids into the fur of her designer cat. She tells me COVID gets in through the eyes. She tells me nothing gets in through her meds, except a killer indica. This one's called Big Pussy. <clears throat> Yeah, so what you dated Big Pussy when you were just a couple of nobodies from Queens? What's it like to turn on the TV and see your old nobody boyfriend while you're still a nobody? Oh yeah, I'm doing fabulous. The other night I listened to sound bowls for five hours on ketamine, and now I can't lie. So yeah, I'm doing the work. Uh, this one's called Mourner's Cottage. There are only nine men at the funeral. This is not enough for a cottage. Minion requires ten. The rabbi shrugs. The Kaddish asked that great peace descend from the heavens, but I guess we won't get peace because we don't know that many men. The ants offered to put on yarmulkes and be men for the occasion, but the rabbi doesn't go for that. So someone went off and found a grave digger to be our tenth man. He threw down his shovel, very casual, and joined our minion, dirty from digging someone else's grave. They forgot to put out chairs, and they fucked up the headstone, and my sister was mad at the rabbi and said, didn't we pay a lot of money to your religion for this? But I nailed the Kaddish because I wrote it out phonetically, and I shed an appropriate amount of tears to show that I was vulnerable, but not hysterical. And then I gave a very touching speech, which was sincere with moments of levity. I made my dad out to be a real folk hero. It was important to be a good son. And I talked about how when he was in prison, he learned to astral project into a bird and fly around to experience freedom, and how maybe that's what he was doing now. But later Jack told me, right as I was saying that, a big heron flew by. But I didn't think it was that meaningful, because the cemetery is right across from a Burger King and the big BK illuminates the headstones at night, and it smells like french fries. I was a sensation. People couldn't stop talking about my perfect Kaddish and my compelling speech, and the rabbi got so flustered by my perfect Kaddish and my compelling speech that he tried to show me up and who could throw the most dirt on the grave. He really went to town with that shovel, and I hoped he'd fall in. <clears throat> this one's called busting. <clears throat> I-70 out of Denver in a rented Kia Sophia with a trunk full of medical grade weed gummies. <clears throat> TCB in a flash on being a man for us, minding the speed limit when I see a cop and sit up straight like a criminal in an Oxford, Oxford cloth button shirt. Doom comes in sirens. Something about a storage unit and crowded planes and COVID and a heartbeat rising through my ribs and out of my throat and into my cheeks spilling all over the dashboard, knowing I'm busted, just not knowing how. Do you want to go to jail, or do you want to answer my questions? In my family, we don't talk to cops. Until we're caught. Step out of the car and put your jacket on. It's windy. This cop kind of looks like me. The man goes in my trunk and at my dash, opening boxes like Christmas. Cars rip by, free. And I think this shoulder is so narrow to play out such broad drama. Wearing dad's jacket that mom bought at Costco with the sleeves down over my wrists. Who's going to come get me? Dad's not home. And I'm not dad because dad is a gangster, and a gangster's hands don't shrink up under the cuffs of their Costco jacket. 
If I make it out of here, I'll be so good to like shave my neck and do all of my reading. My mom spent three months on the living room couch under a gray sheet which she pulled up to her chin like a little vampire. And one day, my sister and I put a bunch of fruit on the little gray mountain range that her body made and took a picture. And she didn't flinch, didn't care, didn't off-balance so much as an apple. And then one day she tried to fight me, so I started dancing like a wild man singing, Mama, I feel so low. Mama, where do I go? And that cooled her off. And later she wrote me that she felt sad that she couldn't answer my questions, and I said, there are any Lennox questions, Mom, you don't have to. <laughs> so it took three more days to get home from the cops, and I swear, when I cross the state line back into Florida, I see a pickup truck swerve onto the shoulder and two guys jump out to chase an iguana with a butterfly net. I swear. Uh, this is the last one. It's called uh, Epilogue, Florida Man, a eulogy. But it's not sad, I promise. <clears throat> Just a little bit. Uh, Florida Man waits 45 minutes for a window seat at the deli. He paces out his impatience in a menacing heat. He eats undersalted matzo ball soup and drives a rascal around the subdivision, smoking a cigar and waving an American flag. Tanned hide earned his victory laps. Florida man was a Russian who could close on real estate in a Turkish bath and then eat light so not to ruin the buoyant feeling of health. Florida man throws a baby alligator through a Wendy's drive-in window, spends his afternoon at Starbucks, not anymore, it's BDS, uh, round tabling, trying to remember the name of that Spanish place in the East Village. And can you believe how much they're charging for a half pound of smoked whitefish salad? Florida man picks up a woman from Brazil with two kids by an Israeli guy who he teaches to jump from the roof into his swimming pool. He drives her down to Miami and waits outside her ayahuasca church for a to-go order but can't find anywhere to pee because everything is closed for COVID. So he just stands around stupid and sweating and then watches her bang her little drum on his patio. And she doesn't tell him she gave some of the plant medicine to the dog who stopped dying for a whole week afterward. Florida man is picking up his son from the commuter train in a swelling monsoon. He turns too early into a flooded parking lot and rolls a cigarette, and his dash lights dim, and the water rises up to his knees, and power lines whip like dragons beyond the safety of his locked doors. Florida man needs to drop square groupers out of a helicopter over Miami until out of concern for his blood pressure, he became a Fort Lauderdale pizzaiolo, and now everyone envies his leather sectional and thick gold chains, the last remains of his cocaine riches. Florida man forgets to pay his homeowner's fee, so he abuses the teen at the security hut and tells him he can't enter his own community. He curses the very gate that he pays an extra $500 for monthly to keep out the same kind of people blank page. They hire to work the gates. Florida man's only employee benefit is telling some asshole he can't go home on the tender anniversary of the expiration of his residence pass. My eyes go to the pen left in the bed of the Florida man who fucked me after feeding me pasta made from chickpea flour. He's just coming off a year of celibacy undertaken for reasons vague and menacing. No one comes. Florida man curls bangs for bat mitzvah, clutches me to his broad and sweaty chest, with stripped down to his A-frame, we waltz to sunrise, sunset. Is this the little girl I carried? Is this the little boy at play? Florida man has taken up full-time residence in a hydraulic recliner. Nothing gets through except a commercial for shakaroni, an extra-large Papa John's pizza, every purchase of which feeds a hungry child in the community. Shakaroni. Desire, delighted to recognize an absurdity which exceeds those he creates in his own mind. Cartwheels away from cops at routine traffic stops. Explains how it's mangroves that help clean the oceans and whips an orchid up into an oak tree to let its air roots hang on for dear life. Rolls around on the shore break to the stings of jellyfish, slicks them all over his neck and torso because he heard the poison is good for circulation. Chews the sand that sticks to the sweat that collects in the condensation on his quickly warming beer. It's just waves, so swim, Florida man. The endless return of the Earth's tidal rhythm. Anyone can make it in this swamp. You just can't keep holding your breath. Thank you.
します。